Hello YouTube. Okay, well I think this is quite an interesting little problem, the paradox of fiction. Um, so, the paradox of fiction. Uh, when you engage with a fiction, you will often feel emotionally moved by the fate and the behaviour of the characters. But there's something rather odd about this, because you don't believe that these characters actually exist. So, why are you moved? How can you be moved by events that aren't real? The paradox of fiction was first developed by Colin Radford, and it results from three individually plausible premises. So, in order for our emotional response to something to be rational, we must believe that that thing exists. Uh, we have rational emotional responses to fictional things, and we do not believe that fictional things exist. Regarding the first premise, it does seem that our emotional reactions generally require a belief in the thing we're responding to. Radford asks us to imagine a man telling you a story about his sister. Uh, and she's had a very bad life. Maybe it started out well, but she suffered many misfortunes and tragedies, and you find the story very moving. It makes you sad. But then after telling you all this, the man reveals that he made it up. The sister doesn't exist. So in this case, it seems you would no longer feel sad. If you were grieving for the man's sister, you'd stop grieving. Um, it would actually be kind of odd to continue feeling sad once you know that he has no sister. Maybe you'd feel sad that he lied to you, but you wouldn't feel sad for his non-existent sister. So, how can we square this with the fact that we're moved by characters who we know in advance don't exist? Um, another example might, might be a child uh, is scared of going to bed because he thinks there's a monster in his cupboard. His parents comfort him by telling him there's nothing to be scared of. There is no monster. So the assumption is that once you no longer believe in the monster, it no longer makes sense to be frightened of it. And in, uh, with this kind of case, if you imagine an adult who refuses to go to bed because he's terrified of the monster in his closet, you know, but being a well-educated adult, he knows perfectly well that monsters don't exist, uh, we'd probably say that his fear is just irrational. If you know there is no monster in your cupboard, surely being scared of the monster in your cupboard is irrational. And yet we often watch horror films, we read scary books, we get scared by them. How can we be scared by... Michael Myers of the, the Halloween films, um, who we know doesn't exist, how can, how can being scared of him be any more rational than being scared by the monster in our cupboards? So that's the, the basic problem. Um, Radford accepts what I'll call irrationality theory. He rejects premise two. According to Radford, our emotional reactions to fictions are not rational. They're irrational, they're inconsistent, they're incoherent. It just doesn't make any damn sense to be moved by fictions. Now, unsurprisingly, a lot of philosophers have wanted to resist this conclusion. Um, but before we uh, examine alternatives, I think it's worth asking just why we want to resist Radford's theory. What's wrong with saying that our emotional responses to fiction are irrational and incoherent? Why can't we just, you know, accept this? Um, in fact, this hasn't really received much discussion in the philosophical literature. It seems like everyone assumes that, of course, we don't want to accept this, um, but nobody really bothers explaining why. So uh, I'll, I'll have a go at it, though. I think there are basically three significant problems with, um, with Radford's view. So first of all, uh, rationality and coherence and consistency and so on are normative. If it's irrational or inconsistent for us to do something, we should stop doing it. But it doesn't seem like we should stop um, responding emotionally to fictions. Fiction is a source of great pleasure for us all, largely because of its power to provoke emotions. So we kind of want to resist the idea that we're just being irrational. Because if we're being irrational, it seems it seems like we should actually we should stop. You know, we should kind of tr try to give up these reactions. Um, second, we need to draw a distinction between two kinds of cases. So first of all, imagine somebody who watches Hamlet and feels sad for Ophelia. Uh, nothing surprising there. Now imagine somebody who watches Hamlet, uh, feels sad for Ophelia, then feels jubilantly happy, then sad again, then extremely angry, then disgusted, then happy again, and so on. Uh, all within the space of uh, five minutes. Um, they just suddenly have all of these mad explosion of different emotional responses, all in five minutes. Um, so... The, the latter kind of response, we want to say, would be irrational, 
Um, and the first kind of response isn't. The first sort of response makes sense. But if we say that all of our emotional responses to fiction are irrational, um, there doesn't seem to be any distinction to be drawn here. Each of these responses is just as reasonable as the other, uh, namely they're not reasonable at all. So that seems to be a problem. How, did, how can we kind of capture the difference between these two responses if we say that all of our emotional responses are irrational? Finally, um, there are significant similarities between our responses to fiction and our responses to real life. To the extent that we, we feel like we can use fiction to help us engage better with the real world. Um, if you imagine someone who just isn't moved by fiction at all, we'd probably say that this person is, is missing something, maybe they're cold and robotic. We might even wonder whether, you know, whether such a person could um, like engage with the real world in a rich and fulfilling way. Um, I mean, at the very least, many people will look to fiction to provide moral or spiritual guidance. We think that fiction can improve our lives. It can improve our, uh, our attitudes, our responses to things. Um, and an important way in which it does this, or so we think, is that it provokes in us emotional reactions and then prompts us to reflect on these emotions in the context of the wider themes and meanings that the fiction explores. But, how could it offer any of this guidance or improvement? How could it work in these ways if it's simply irrational for us to have any emotional response to it? So we have some problems here. Um, it seems like we want to consider some alternatives uh, to, to Radford's idea. Um, one of the, uh, um, well, not really popular, but perhaps you might think kind of I don't know, obvious alternatives is the illusion theory. Now, this theory is actually just really stupid, and I'm not sure that any major philosophers ever actually suggested this as a solution to the paradox of fiction. Um, but this theory rejects the third premise. This says that actually, when we engage with fictions, we do believe that the fictional characters exist. Um, when we get uh, caught up in a fictional story, we forget that it's fictional. Um, we think that the characters are real. So this is why it's called the illusion theory. The idea is that fictions literally deceive us. You know, it's, um, it's like seeing a mirage in the desert or something. You know, we, we think there's really water there. When we watch a fiction, we think it's, it's real because we get caught up in it. And I suppose some of the ways we talk about fictions might seem to support this. We often talk about suspension of disbelief. Um, when you watch a film about aliens or ghosts or whatever, you're asked to suspend your disbelief. So um, what does that mean? You sort of come to believe that there are ghosts or that the events in the fiction really happen. Um, I'm not I'm not sure. Uh, or people will often criticise a fiction on the grounds that it's not believable. Uh, again, this seems to suggest maybe that we actually come to believe fictions. Some fictions um, we, for whatever reason, can't come to believe. The illusion doesn't work and that's a problem. Um, as I said, this theory is, is really stupid. It's obviously wrong. We simply do not get confused into thinking that fiction is real. When you watch a James Bond film and there's a bunch of bad guys running around with guns, you don't think, oh, oh my god, I better get out of the room just in case one of the bullets flies my way. You know, When you watch a play and the character dies, you don't walk onto the stage to comfort the grieving relatives. Um, as for the idea of suspension of disbelief, I, I don't really know what this is. Um, this is one of those cases where lots of people are throwing around a popular phrase, um, but I'm not sure there's actually a coherent concept here. But whatever suspension of disbelief is, it certainly doesn't involve um, literally coming to believe that the fictional events are really happening. Uh, same with believability. When we say a fiction is believable, we don't mean that we literally come to believe it. That refers, I think, more to sort of realism. It refers to the idea that the fictional events are the kind of things that, that could take place. doesn't mean we, we really believe that they, they have taken place or are taking place. just mean that they're not like really weird or strange. So um, pure illusion theory is, is, is silly. However, could there be a kind of a weaker illusion theory? Um, could it be maybe that some part of your brain believes that the characters do exist? Perhaps the, uh, the primitive part of your brain is hoodwinked by the fiction. Um, while the kind of rational higher part knows that it's not real. Not, not so many philosophers have pursued this, but it seems actually quite plausible to me. 
Consider optical illusions. Here's a really beautiful illusion, one of my favourites. Now, um, you see the square marked A and the square marked B. Both of these shades of grey are exactly the same. A and B are exactly the same shade of grey. Um, it's it's because of the sort of wider context that they look different. But if we remove the context, you can see that they are exactly the same. Now, if you think there was any trickery here, just save the picture and try it yourself. They are the same shade of grey. So here's the illusion again. Now, um, at this point, you know that these shades of grey are exactly the same. You, you know it intellectually, you know it rationally, but you still see them as being different. They still look different. And there's, there's nothing you can do about this. No matter how hard you look at this picture, those shades of grey appear to be different, even though you know that they're not. So what's going on here is that there are at least two parts of the brain involved in this. You've got the cognitive rational part, the part that's involved in the, in the sort of higher complex reasoning functions, all that stuff. But then you've also got the visual processing system. And even though one part of your brain knows that those shades of grey are different, that information simply has no effect on your visual processing. So perhaps we could apply this sort of account to our reactions to fictions. And this is suggested by Jonathan Frome. Frome distinguishes between what he calls global appraisals and local appraisals. Um, when we perceive something, we'll make a judgment about whether it's real or a representation. There's a difference between seeing a car, seeing a painting of a car, and seeing a mirror that's reflecting an Im the image of a car. So this sort of judgment, um, whether something is real or representation, this is kind of high level. It requires attending to various different properties of the thing and then making a very general judgment about it. On the other hand, there are lower level judgments. Um, what shape is the object? What colour is it? Is it moving or is it still? And so on. Now, determining whether something is real or a representation is a global appraisal. Determining the more specific properties, such as colour or shape, is a local appraisal. Now, of course, the global appraisal is arrived at by considering the information given by the local appraisal. You have to consider the, you know, the colour and the shape and so on in order to arrive at a global appraisal. But we can still draw a distinction here. Now, as far as local appraisal is concerned, whether or not something really exists is irrelevant. The local appraisal sees blue. It doesn't matter whether this is the blue of a real car, the blue of a painting of a car, or the blue of a reflection of a car. So the, the suggestion here, uh, as far as I can tell, is that emotional reactions are prompted by merely local appraisals. It's not that global appraisal is irrelevant to emotion. If I believe that the monster shown on the film really exists, then I'm going to be even more scared. The point is that local judgments are enough for some emotional reactions. When we see an evil-looking monster, this provokes fear. When we see a, a vulnerable woman in dire straits, this provokes pity. The global appraisal, the question of whether this is uh, a representation or reality, uh, comes later. Now one suggestion for how this might work from um, William Irwin and David Johnson is mirror neurons. Mirror neurons are neurons that imitate what would be going on in other people's heads. This was first researched in the context of performing actions. Basically, you have a bunch of neurons in your brain that are involved in motor command and they fire when you perform actions. Take a simple action like looking at your watch. So you raise your left arm slightly up to your face, tilt your head down, and look at your watch. When you do this, your motor command neurons will fire in a specific way. Now suppose you watch somebody else do the same thing. They raise their left arm, tilt their head, look at their watch. Then a subset of your motor command neurons will fire as you watch this, matching how they fire when you yourself perform the action. So these neurons fire both when you do something and when you watch somebody else do it. So what, what these neurons do, uh, it seems, is create in you internal states that uh, hopefully should match the internal states of the person you're looking at. Further research has shown that we also have mirror neurons for emotions. When we see somebody display sadness, neurons in our brain will mirror their state. And what's important is that mirror neurons are tuned to local appraisals. We know that Game of Thrones isn't real, but that doesn't matter. When we see that Sansa is terribly unhappy and abused and in a generally horrible situation, our mirror neurons will mimic what her brain would be doing 
if she were real. Uh, and quite naturally, we experience various emotions in res in response to this. Um, the, the problem with the original illusion theory, the pure illusion theory, is that it assumes that illusions have to generate incorrect beliefs. But illusions need not be like that, because different parts of the brain deal with different things. Uh, as Owen and Johnson say, the part of our brain responsible for emotional reactions is not smart enough to see through the illusion. Uh, we know that those two shades of grey are not the same colour, but we still see them as different because our visual processing isn't affected by our rational judgement. We know that Sansa isn't real, but we still feel, feel, feel for her because our mirror neurons aren't affected by our rational judgments. Our local appraisals aren't affected by our global appraisals. I think this is a very interesting approach. Um, it's not really received much discussion. Um, now, an immediate problem, which Owen and Johnson do mention, and then they immediately dismiss it, uh, I'm not really sure this should be dismissed so quickly, is that it's not clear how to apply this to uh, literature and poetry and so on. When you watch Game of Thrones, you see Sansa, you see her situation, you see her evince these emotions, so of course your mirror neurons fire in response to that. On the other hand, if you're reading about Sansa in A Song of Ice and Fire, there's nothing, you, there's nothing for your mirror neurons to mirror, there's just words on a page. Um, as I say, this is an interesting idea, it would be worth trying to develop it, but um, for us, it's time to move on. One of the most infamous responses to the paradox of fiction is the quasi-emotion theory, or pretend theory, which has been defended by Kendall Walton. Now, Walton, like Radford, rejects premise two. He says that we do not have rational emotional responses to fictional characters. But according to Walton, it's not that our emotional reactions aren't rational. Rather, they simply aren't emotions. We don't really have emotional reactions to fiction. When you watch that terrifying horror film, you don't really feel scared. When you read a heartbreaking novel, you don't really feel sadness or pity. When your favourite character succeeds and gets all the money and women and so on, you don't really feel joy. Walton asks us to consider a child being chased by his father. The father is pretending to be a monster and the child is pretending to be in mortal danger. So the child is running away from the father, screaming, it looks like he's terribly afraid. But, of course, he's not experiencing real fear. Um, there are some similarities to fear, but there are important differences. So the child is having fun, he's smiling, he's coming back for more. The child is, is really just engaging in make-believe. Make-believedly the child is in danger. When he screams and runs, make-believedly he's, he's afraid. So now consider Charles, who's watching a particularly terrifying film involving green slime. Personally, I don't see how a film about green slime could possibly be scary, uh, and I'm quite easily scared by films. But this is Walton's example. He seems, he, he's a guy who's scared of green slime. So anyway, in a particularly tense moment, the slime oozes towards the camera, and Charles seems to be paralysed with fear. He lets out a gasp, covers his eyes, his heart is racing. Basically, uh, according to Walton, What's going on here is really just like what's going on with the child and his father. Charles isn't really afraid, just as Charles isn't really threatened. Uh, and he knows he isn't really threatened. Rather, make-believedly, Charles is threatened. And make-believedly, he's afraid. He's just participating uh, in the fiction, like an actor. Just as the child is participating, he's, Charles is pretending to be afraid. Now, obviously... Charles isn't merely acting. He does genuinely feel something. He experiences many things that we'd usually associate with fear. Uh, psycholog physiological arousal, high pulse rate, tense muscles, he's squirming in his seat, maybe he jumps occasionally. So he's really experiencing all of these things. These are real. According to Walton, what this is, what Charles is really experiencing, is quasi-fear. We pretend, or we make believe, that this response, this quasi-fear, is real fear. But it isn't. Although there are similarities, there are also notable differences. So these, these are some differences between quasi-fear and real fear. This is how we distinguish them. First of all, uh, quasi-fear doesn't depend on existence beliefs. Whereas being afraid of the green slime would require believing that the slime really exists, experiencing quasi-fear as a result of the slime doesn't require this. Um, 
Second, quasi-fear has different behavioural consequences. If Charles was really afraid, he'd get up, he'd run out of the cinema, he'd call the police. You know, there's, there's green slime on the loose attacking everyone. You'd, you'd want to get the word out and warn people, and you'd, you'd run away from it yourself. But Charles does none of these things. He remains sitting in his chair, he carries on watching the film. Third, quasi-fear is compatible with other emotions in ways that fear isn't. Um, in particular, you can enjoy quasi-fear. If you were genuinely afraid of the green slime, it would be a very negative emotion. Um, you'd want the emotion to go away. You'd, you'd run away and try to stop being afraid. Um, but when you, when you watch a film, you can enjoy it. We watch horror films precisely because we want to experience these powerful reactions. Some of us do at any rate. You know, the, 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 the kind of quasi-fear reaction, the, uh, the, 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 the racing pulse and tense muscles, that's, that's fun. That's fun to experience that because it's not real fear. We're not really afraid. So it's, it's very important to emphasise that Walton does not deny that people have feelings and reactions to fictions. Some people have thought that Walton is saying that when we engage with fictions, we just pretend to have feelings. But as you can see, that's not quite true. Walton accepts that we have feelings when we watch fictions. We have responses. They're sometimes quite powerful responses. When Charles watches a horror film about green slime and he says, I'm afraid of the green slime, Walton agrees that Charles has a response to the green slime. Charles's response really, Charles's actual response, is what Walton calls quasi-fear. And quasi-fear feels very much like real fear. We pretend, we make believe, that this quasi-fear is genuine fear. So when we watch a scary horror movie, we're moved, we have a response, but the response isn't fear, it's quasi-fear. We make believe that quasi-fear is real fear. Um, so just bear that in mind. Um, and actually, this is, I kind of prefer to call this quasi-emotion theory rather than pretend theory, because obviously we have powerful responses to fiction. We're not just pretending to have feelings, and Walton doesn't deny this. You know, we, we genuinely do experience quasi-emotions. Uh, what we're pretending is that the quasi-emotions are real emotions. You know, we, we experience quasi-fear, make believedly the quasi-fear is real fear. So you have to... I, I've been emphasising this, I know I've been emphasising it a lot, but it's something that's very important to keep in mind. Um, one way this theory might seem more plausible is if we consider Charles watching the movie with a companion. Um, so as the slime approaches, Charles says something like, you know, watch out, here it comes. Now clearly, this isn't a serious warning. Y you know, he's engaging in make-believe. He's pretending to assert that they're in danger from the slime. He's playing along with the fiction. This is a fairly unambiguous case where I think that there really is make-believe going on. Similarly, if you say to others, or you merely say to yourself, you know, I'm afraid of the slime, uh, or I detest Joffrey, I pity Sansa, you're engaging in make-believe, you're playing along with the fiction. Now, Walton notes that his theory solves two other puzzles. First, consider a playgoer who doesn't like happy endings. He finds them too generic and sentimental. He likes fiction to end in disaster. So he wants the heroine to die. But at the same time, he gets caught up in the story. He has sympathy for the heroine. He feels the suspense and tension when she's threatened. Uh, so in another sense, he's rooting for her. He wants her to survive. He might even make exclamations of encouragement. You know, as the villains bear down on her, he shouts, you know, come on! Um, so he seems to be sort of supporting her. But this just looks outright contradictory. On the one hand he wants her to die because he doesn't like happy endings, on the other he's clearly rooting for her. And yet this sort of reaction uh, isn't at all unusual. Now, uh, Walton has a nice response to this, a nice solution. Because what Walton can say is that make-believedly he sympathises with her and feels sad when she dies. But he really wants it to be the case that she dies. I hope you can see how, how, this, how this works. He genuinely desires that, make-believedly, the heroine die. He genuinely desires that the heroine dies. He make-believedly desires that she live. He genuinely feels happy when she dies. He make-believedly feels sad when she dies. There's no conflict here. He enjoys making believe that disaster has occurred. He enjoys making believe that he feels sadness and disappointment. I think that's quite a nice a nice little solution to that problem. 
Second, how can there be suspense if you already know what's coming? This problem arises when we read a book or watch a film a second time, uh, or with any fiction where it's obviously going to end well, you know, where, where it's kind of clearly set out. I mean, in any TV show, for instance, the protagonist isn't going to die in the second episode, and we all know that. Um, most of us have had this experience. We re-watch Alien, we know that Ripley will survive, but we still feel suspense when she's threatened by the monster. Walton's theory provides a nice account of how this is possible. We know that Ripley escapes, but make-believedly, we don't know that Ripley escapes. Make-believedly, we're uncertain. Make-believedly, we feel suspense and tension. We participate in the fiction by making believe that we don't know what's coming. There are two other points that uh, Walton doesn't mention, but I think his theory helps to solve these problems as well. So third, we might be able to use this theory to, to help with the paradox of tragedy. Essentially, the paradox of tragedy is why do, we why do we desire to experience unpleasant emotions? Why do we seek out and apparently enjoy fictions that we know will cause us to feel scared or sad or disgusted or depressed? Um, basically, the paradox of tragedy is this. Tragedy, tragedy causes negative emotions. We tend to avoid things that cause negative emotions. We don't tend to avoid tragedy. On Walton's theory, the answer is simple. Tragedy doesn't cause negative emotions. It causes quasi-emotions, such as quasi-sadness. Indeed, we don't enjoy feeling sad, and we don't seek out things that make us sad. But we can enjoy uh, quasi-sadness. We can enjoy making believe that we feel sad. Quasi-sadness need not be unpleasant, so there's no paradox here. Simply and easily solved. Fourth, we often root for the villains and root against the good guys. Earlier I mentioned Sansa from Game of Thrones. Sansa's got it really bad. Everyone pities Sansa. I don't pity Sansa. I want her to die. I hate her. She's always just moping around, all miserable, you know, Oh, Joffrey cut off my dad's head. Wow, 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 I'm so depressed. She's boring. I like Tywin Lannister, Ramsay Bolton, Peter Baelish, all the evil bastards. That's who I like. Now, I know that this isn't just me, right? Lots of us will root for the villains. And Walton's theory makes perfect sense of this. It's not that I genuinely dislike Sansa and genuinely like Peter Baelish. If there was, you know, a, a real person in Sansa's posi position, of course I would feel a, a great deal of pity for her. If there was a real person like Peter Baelish, of course I'd hate him. Um, but Walton can say... When you watch Game of Thrones, you're engaging in a pretense, in make-believe. You're imaginatively pretending to hate Sansa and Peter Baelish. You're, you're adopting the attitude uh, of an evil villain in the context of make-believe. And that's okay. That's all good fun. Again, I, I quite like this, uh, this solution to that, to that little problem. I think that's quite nice. It's quite a good solution. So you can see that there are some benefits to this theory. However... It does have some problems. First of all, there's something deeply implausible, deeply counterintuitive, about the suggestion that we don't really feel emotions when we engage with fictions. Uh, I mean, this just doesn't seem to square with our own experiences at all. Um, and we might wonder, really, how well-motivated the idea is. Walton actually says in his paper, um, I quote, it is a principle of common sense, one that ought not to be abandoned if there is any reasonable alternative, that fear must be accompanied by, or must involve, a belief that one is in danger. Well, I, I would say simply, you know, I, I don't think that is a principle of common sense. Um, I, I don't think it's just obvious that fear requires belief. Prima facie, I would have thought that fear can be provoked by all kinds of things. What's commonsensical in my view is that we feel fear and sadness and anger and so on towards fictional characters. This seems to me far more commonsensical than the idea that emotions require existence beliefs. Anyway, the basic point here is that Walton's theory seems to seriously violate the evidence of our own experience. In many ways, nothing could be more obvious than that when I watch uh, the Japanese film Ring, I feel scared, or that when Boromir dies in Lord of the Rings, I feel sad. I think um, Noel Carroll put the, point, put, put the point quite nicely. He said that Walton throws out the phenomenology for the sake of logic. Um, Walton might have a plausible response to this problem. Uh, he could say, well, of course it feels, it, you know, it, it, of course it seems to us that we feel fear when we watch Ring. 
This is because quasi-fear feels very much like real fear. There's not much to distinguish them from the inside, as it were. They feel very much the same. So of course it seems obvious that we feel emotions when we engage with fictions, but really they're just quasi-emotions. Um, but second, we might point out that there's a significant disanalogy between Walton's example of the child running away from his father and Charles watching a film of the green slime. It's reasonable to speak of the child make-believedly being afraid, because the child really is acting, in a sense. The child is make-believedly threatened. That's part of the game, right? The, 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 the father is a monster that threatens the child. But when watching a film, we're not, we're not acting or participating in this kind of way. Charles isn't even make-believedly threatened. I mean, generally speaking, it's rare for films to break the fourth wall and involve viewers. And even when they do break the fourth wall, we don't have to participate in that. We can keep watching with the uh, usual sort of detached attitude. Fictions, in general, will present a self-contained world, uh, which we engage with as external observers. With the child playing a game with his father, he's not an external observer. He's part of that fictional world. Um... Now, I'm not sure whether this is a big problem for Walton. Uh, after all, there are many ways of engaging in make-believe. Uh, the case of the child being chased by his father is just to, supposed to be uh, an illustrative analogy. It, you know, it doesn't have to be exactly the same. Uh, I think Walton, um, Walton does actually say that we can think of the fictional world of the film uh, extending to include Charles. Uh, or rather, you know, Charles can make-believe that he's in the fictional world that the film depicts. Um, so even though in one sense he's a, he's a sort of external observer, he can you know bring himself down to he can bring himself into the fictional world. He can make believe that he's in that world. Um, so I'm not sure whether you know the details of the analogy really matter. Um, a more serious problem is that our reactions to fictions are involuntary. If we're just engaging in make believe, why are some films too scary? Uh, what about when the feeling of fear doesn't go away? I remember watching a horror film called Sinister at about one in the morning, and I found it pretty terrifying. What's more, even when the film was over, I still felt scared. Uh, and I like to go downstairs and get food and things at night. But this particular night, I decided I didn't really want to go downstairs on my own at, you know, two o'clock in the morning. I'll stay in my room. I was scared. I was afraid. Or at least I thought I was afraid. For Walton, I was only make-believing that I was afraid. But if it was really just make-believe, how come I couldn't choose to stop it? You know, similarly, you can't help but feel suspense as Ripley is threatened by the alien. You can't help but feel sadness at Sansa's plight, unless you're like me. Um, generally, when you imagine something, when you make-believe something, when you pretend, you have control over it. This just isn't the case for our reactions to fictions. We don't have control over them. Now, we might respond that we have to keep in mind that Walton doesn't deny that we have quasi-emotions, and quasi-emotions need not be voluntary. What's make-believe is that the quasi-emotion is a real emotion, but you really do have the quasi-emotion. So I really did experience quasi-fear and you know, after I watched Sinister, and that was what I still felt after the film had finished. You know, I was still in that quasi-fear state, and that's why I didn't want to go downstairs. So maybe, maybe you could respond this way. Uh, however, this leads sort of straight to another problem. Surely we can only make believe that we have an emotion if we don't believe that we really have the emotion. This would seem to be a conceptual truth. You can only pretend that X is the case if you don't believe that X really is the case. That's by definition part of what pretending is. If you really believe that something is the case, how can you pretend that it's the case? If you take yourself to be genuinely afraid, how can you pretend to be afraid? You, know, you, can, you can only either evince what you think your feelings are or not. Um, but most people, when they engage with fictions, take themselves to be experiencing genuine emotions. Charles thinks he's genuinely afraid of the green slime. So what, poss what could possibly be, in, you know, how could Charles possibly pretend to be afraid of the green slime if he thinks he's really afraid of the green slime? Uh, I, I mean, that just seems to kind of stretch the, the concept of pretending um, beyond any reasonable, you know, beyond any reasonable limit. It, it, it just seems like by definition this, uh, this Walton's theory has to be false. So there's a, there's a big problem here. 
Um, another serious problem for Walton's theory is giving a, uh, a clear definition and explanation of the nature of quasi-emotions. Recall that we distinguish quasi-emotions from real emotions in three ways. First, quasi-emotions don't depend on existence beliefs. Second, quasi-emotions have different behavioural consequences. When we're afraid of the green slime, we don't run and call the police. When we, we, we pity and feel sad for Ophelia, we don't run onto the stage and try to comfort her. And finally, quasi-emotions are compatible with other emotions in ways that their real counterparts aren't. Quasi-fear is compatible with feeling great enjoyment, for instance. Um, the problem is we just can't demarcate quasi-emotions from emotions by appealing to these three things. Take the second point first. This depends on an absurdly simplistic view of emotions. So, so consider fear. Right? Often fear is evinced in our behaviour, but just as often it fails to move us. One example that I've read is uh, lying on an operating table. You're terrified of surgery and hospitals and anaesthetics and so on. You, you know, it's a horrible experience, you're terribly afraid, but you don't try to run away. You lay there and put up with it. Now, you might be tempted to say, well, this is because you know the operation will have benefits. If you didn't believe the operation would have those benefits, you'd get up and run away. The problem with this response is that if we allow this, then why not, if you believed the green slime was real, then you would get up and run away? In both cases, your fear doesn't make you run away. In both cases, it would make you run away if your beliefs were different. Um, so we just can't demarcate quasi-fear from real fear by appealing to these different behavioural consequences. Uh, it seems that the fear we experience towards the green slime has just the same kind of behavioural consequences as the fear we experience at the hospital. Um, so that doesn't, uh, that doesn't work. And similarly, you know, it's, it's the same is true of, of other emotions. We're not moved to run onto the stage in comfort Ophelia, sure. But very often we're not moved to do anything for, for, thing, for people we feel for, for people we feel pity for. I see a documentary about people starving in Africa, but I'm not moved to go and try to comfort them. The most you might try to do is pick up a phone and donate to charity, but a lot of people don't even do that. Um, at worst, sometimes sadness and pity uh, just sort of cannot have any behavioral consequences. They, they don't even dispose us to act in certain ways. This is a case when we're sad about things that have happened in the past. In this case, we have no motivation whatsoever to intervene, because, just like with fictions, we know there's nothing we can do. How about compatibility with other emotions? We enjoy quasi-fear, we don't enjoy real fear. Again, this is just absurdly simplistic. Um, it, it seems to me that people can enjoy real fear. There are people who seek out the adrenaline rush that comes with putting themselves in real danger. Think of people who do extreme sports. A lot of these people will claim that they're afraid, but that's actually part of what they seek out in those experiences. You know, they, they enjoy the fear. What we're left with then is simply the claim that quasi-emotions are different from real emotions in that quasi-emotions don't require existence beliefs. Obviously, we can't simply appeal to that. The very claiming question here is whether we can experience emotions in response to things we don't believe exist. So it would just be begging the question to exist. It, it would just be begging the question to insist, oh, well, they're not real emotions because they're directed at fiction. I mean, at the end of the day, the problem is that quasi-emotions are basically exactly the same as real emotions, you know, except they don't depend on existence beliefs. So, you know, what independent reasons do we have for positing quasi-emotions? Why not just say that our responses to fiction are one among many varieties of emotion? The quasi-emotion theorist needs to give a much more robust account of the nature of quasi-emotions than uh, anyone has so far given. I mean, in general, emotions have different forms. Think of sadness caused by a relative dying, sadness caused by uh, looking forward to eating chocolate ice cream only to discover that your greedy brother has eaten it all, and sadness caused by the general sense that the world just isn't going right, there's just something wrong with the world. Sadness is incredibly varied, and it seems totally arbitrary to point at sadness caused by fictional events and say, ah well, that isn't real sadness, that isn't real sadness. All this other these other incredibly varied feelings, they are all real sadness, but if you've been watching a film, no, that's not real sadness. So, I think there are just some serious problems with the very concept of, of quasi-emotions. 
Finally, uh, we can ask, does introducing the idea of quasi-motions really help us solve the paradox in any case? I mean, can't we just run the paradox again in terms of quasi-motions? Because surely what's in question is how it's rational for Charles to have any response whatsoever to the green slime, given that he doesn't believe that the green slime exists. I mean, why, why, why would we be moved to this thing called quasi-fear? How is it rational to be moved to quasi-fear, whatever quasi-fear really is, if we don't believe that, you know, the, the, the thing that's moving us exists, right? It seems to me that the problem is still there. Um, so even if we kind of accept Walton's whole theory, it's not actually obvious to me that it, that it solves the paradox. Right, well, um, that's enough for today. There are lots of other responses to the paradox of fiction, and we'll look at those in the next video. Um, but, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's all for now. So I'll, um, I'll see you soon. Goodbye.